So that what we're going to do in channel capacity is look at two, two formulas that tell us the relationship between the bandwidth of our signal and the data rate that we can achieve. So they give us a good indicator. If we know something about our communication signal, we can work out, or well, how fast can we send bits using that signal or using that communications link, the channel capacity. But to do that, we need some a little bit of background knowledge that some of you may have, some may not. So let's go through it for everyone. Uh, we, we need to talk about and introduce decibels. So some of may have covered it in other topics. Let's try and make sure everyone understands what we mean by a decibel and the issues of gain and loss. If, if you have 1,000 baht, for example, and you give that to your friend, you borrow, uh, you lend the money to your friend, 1,000 baht, and in a week's time your friend returns and gives you 1,000 baht plus an extra 1,000, 2,000 baht in total in return. What's your profit? Uh, absolute value, absolute profit. You start with a thousand, you give it to your friend, he gives back two thousand next week. What's your profit? A thousand baht. You've gained one thousand baht. Okay, now from a uh, relative to the initial amount of money you had, how much have you gained? <coughs> relative to the initial one thousand baht, you've you've gained 100% or think of it as a, a ratio or a factor. You've doubled your money. Okay, You start with 1,000, you get 2,000 back, so you've doubled your money. So we can say the gain in this case is a factor of 2. So the double times by 2. So we use and when we look at communication systems, we look at the gain of systems and also we'll see the loss of systems. But the same can be applied in, in many different systems. Uh, so if I start with 1,000 and end up with 2,000, then we can say the gain as a ratio or as a factor is 2. There are no units to this gain. It's just a multiplier. I've increased by a factor of 2. What if I start with 1,000 and my friend gives back 250? 250 baht. I've got a gain of what? He's in trouble, yes, or I'm in trouble. I've got lost money. Uh, okay, so the gain, I've lost 750 baht, so then as a ratio relative to the initial amount, the gain we say is 0 0.25, one quarter. I start with 1,000. I end up with 0 0.25, so relative to the 1,000 I've got one quarter of it. So we can say the gain in that system is one quarter, 0 0.25. Another way to express this gain of 0 0.25 is what? Did I gain money? I lost money. We can express that as a loss. What's the loss in that case? The, the loss as a ratio. How much did I lose in that case? I start with 1,000 baht, I end up with 250 baht. How would you express the loss in that? Well, the gain is 0.25, one quarter. We can say that is a loss of a factor of 4. I start with 1,000, divide by 4 in this case. I end up with 250. So we can express these ratios as either a gain or a loss, where really gain and loss are the inverse of each other. The, a loss is a, uh, the negative of a gain. When we deal with communication systems, we also need to look at uh, gains and loss of systems. We transmit with some power level. We transmit a signal. The signal propagates through our communication system and is received with some weaker, lower power level. We can say there's a loss of power in that case. 
and we want to be able to express that. Let's go through some examples, and that, this would lead us to decibels and, and the basic notation or the basic formula for decibels. Now, that was the example about money. Let's consider an example about, say, the amplifier for this audio system. When I talk, I produce a signal of some output strength. It goes into the microphone and eventually into the amplifier in the cupboard, which increases the signal strength. So the signal that comes out of the speaker is louder than what's coming out of my mouth. We have some gain in the system. Let's express that and calculate as with some simple examples. So we can draw this system. We have some system. We have some input and an output. So here's our system, the rectangle, and the input, let's express, we have some input, and we, with communication systems we often talk about power, measured in watts, for example. So I'll say we have some power in, P in, in, and some power out. I have a system which takes as an some input power, and if it's an amplifier, it increases the input power and produces an output power. And by looking at those two power levels, we can determine the gain or loss of that system. So let's take an example. Let's say my input power is 1,000. Let's say, let's, to give it units, watts. W for watts. 1,000 watts in some amplifier, and the output it produces is 2,000 watts. That's a zero. What's the gain of my amplifier? What's the gain of the amplifier? Two. I've started with 1,000, in, I end up, this is a zero, as what 2,000 out. The absolute increase is 1,000 watts, but relative to the input, we say the output is two times larger. So simply the gain of this system is two. So we can express that, let's say G equals two, the gain is two. There are no units for gain. It's a factor or a ratio or a multiplier. Output is two times larger than the input. What if I started with my 1000 watts but the output was 250 watts? So I start with an input of 1000 watts and the output power is 250 watts. What's the gain? What's the gain first? 0.25. You're ahead. One quarter in this case. So the input's the same. I start with 1,000 watts. The output is 250 watts. The gain is one quarter, 0.25 in this case. It's not an amplifier, or not a very good amplifier, because it's decreased the output signal in this case. It's produced a loss, in fact. So the loss in this case we could express as 4. G for gain. A gain of 0.25 is the equivalent to the loss of a factor of 4 in this case. 4 times less than the input, the output is. Start with 1,000, divide by 4, and I get the output of 250, so we say the loss is a factor of 4. The gain is a factor of 0.25 in this case. So with any system, when we have some input and output, we can talk about its gain and loss, whether it's money, a financial system, whether it's a communication system, whether it's anything that has some input, quantified input and output, we can measure the gain and loss. 
we usually, at least in communication systems, are talking about ratios or factors. Two times larger, four times smaller. Uh, another example. <coughs> Our input is uh, the input on the left side, let's give a different numbers, 100 milliwatts. And the output, we end up with uh, one microwatt. What's the gain of this system? Or maybe easier, what's the loss of this system? So the input power, now consider a communication system. My wireless transmitter on my laptop transmits a signal. The strength of that signal that's coming out has a power level of 100 milliwatts. That signal propagates through the air and goes up to the access point, the receiver. And we measure the received signal to be one, that is a mu, one microwatt. What's the, in this case it's a loss, we've gone from 100 milliwatts down to 1 microwatt. What's the loss of this communication system? Try and calculate. Hundred milliwatts down to 1 microwatt, it will be 100,000. It's 100, 1 microwatt is 100,000 times smaller than 100 milliwatts. So be careful with your prefixes here. 100 milliwatts is milli to convert to micro, we multiply by 1000. So 100,000 microwatts. So the loss is a factor of 100,000. So I won't write the gain, but the loss in this case. One hundred thousand. The output is one hundred thousand times smaller than the input. Now, in communication systems, we often talk about gain and loss, and Another way to express gain and loss is using decibels. And the convenience of decibels is it we use a logarithmic scale and it reduces this usually reduces the size of the numbers so that they're more manageable. And in fact we'll see later that we can do operations much easier. So let's convert this this loss into decibels. And the general formula is, and we'll see it, you've got it on some of the handouts in one of your initial handouts, definitions and concepts. We had some acronyms and towards the bottom after units and prefixes, so this is after logarithms, decibels and signal strength. We'll only go through part of this. But we see the general equation to convert some in this case, a gain into, from the unitless as a factor into decibels, 10 times log base 10 <coughs> of our gain. And similar with a loss, 10 times log base 10 of our loss converts some number into decibel form. I'll write that on the board. So we can switch back. So the absolute gain of a system is the power out divided by the power in, the output divided by the input. If my output was 2,000, my input was 1,000, my gain is 2. That's what we've calculated so far. So far. The loss is the opposite, or in this case, the input 
divided by the output. If I start with in 1000 watts and I get an output of 250 watts, then I say that's a loss of 4, a factor of 4. So that's the way to calculate the loss. It's just the inverse of the gain in the absolute values. And that's what we did in this example. We said the input was 100 milliwatts, the output was 1 microwatt. The input 100 milliwatts divided by 1 microwatt and the loss is 100,000. There are no units here. It's a, it's a factor or ratio. <coughs> to convert into decibels, you've got it on uh, your handouts, but the get de decibels for gain, we take 10 log base 10 of G in this case, of the absolute value. Think of this as the absolute value, this is the value in decibels. Where G is really P out divided by P in. And the loss in decibels is the same equation, 10 log base 10 of P in divided by P out. In fact, the general equation for decibels is simply 10 times log base 10 of some factor. Okay, we can apply it to any system. So remember that. If you know some absolute ratio, then you can convert it to decibels by taking the logarithm of that ratio and multiplying by 10. Let's do it on our example. The loss, the absolute value is 100,000 in decibels. That's equivalent to, well, we take the log in base 10 of 100,000, which is, you don't need a calculator there. What's the log of 100,000? Five, one hundred thousand. Now this is your high school mathematics, and if you can't remember, you go and take one of the lessons. There's a lesson online you can do. Not many people have done it. Ten to the power of five, log base ten of ten to the power of five is simply five. Okay, so this is an easy one. So log of one hundred thousand in base ten is five times by ten. We get fifty. So we can say this loss of 100,000 is the same as a loss of 50 dB. Fifty decibels. They are the same. This is the absolute value. This is the value given in decibels. What about our gain? If we go back up to our first example, we went from 1,000 watts to 2,000 watts, we had a gain of 2. Again, we can convert that into decibels. We take the logarithm of 2 and multiply by 10. There you need your calculator, okay, the logarithm of, of 2. Uh, so 10 times log of 2 is about 3. The log of 2 is about 0 0.3, 0 0.301. So 10 times that is 3. That is, our gain of 2 is the same as 3 dB, 3 decibels.
Okay, so we can express our gain or loss as either an absolute value or a, a in decibels. Gain of point zero point two five. Again, we take the logarithm of 0.25 and multiply by 10. So the log of 0 0.25 is minus 0 0.6 times by 10, about minus 6, minus 6.02. So a gain of 0 0.25 is the same as about minus 6 dB. A gain of minus 6 dB is a loss of how many dB? And this is where using decibels becomes easy. A gain of 0 0.25 is equivalent to a gain of minus 6 decibels. A gain of 0 0.25 is equivalent to a loss of 4. A gain of 0 0.25, we reduce by a factor of 4, is the same as a loss of 4. We've reduced by a factor of 4. Okay. So a gain of a quarter is the same as a loss of 4. And the expressed in decibels, minus 6 dB, the loss will be plus 6 dB. You can do the calculation. Take 4 times by a log in base 10 of 4, log in base 10 of 4 times by 6 is plus 6 dB. And this is where decibel, one reason where decibels become easier to work with. Measured in decibels, the a loss is the negative of a gain. Measured, measured in absolute values is the inverse. But because we're taking the logarithms, the properties of logarithms turns that into the negative value. So a gain of minus 6 dB is the same as a loss of 6 dB. A gain of 100 dB is the same as a loss of minus 100 dB. Okay, so they're just the, the negative of each other in decibels. We'll see later when we go through different communication systems, many things are measured in decibels. They're generally easier to work with, especially when we have large values. That is, a loss of 100,000, well, a large number, is simply 50 dB. When we have a loss of 1 billion, then we can easily calculate and express in decibels. So, what you need to know is given some ratio, a gain is just a ratio of output divided by input, to convert into equivalent for decibels, log in base 10 of that ratio multiplied by 10. Gain is output divided by in, loss is the inverse, in divided by out. Any questions about decibels so far? Easy. Some of the simplest mathematics you'll see in your degree. And the concepts are quite simple. To be clear, the loss and gain have no units. There's no units here. It's a ratio or a factor. Similar, we say decibels is not a unit, think of it as just indicating a different scale. 
of our loss or gain. As we go through the course, we'll see some variations of decibels, dB watts, dB milliwatts, and so on, but not yet. Given that, now that we know about dB, uh, some simple or some common ones which are useful to remember, doubling a gain of 2 is about 3 dB. And if you double again a gain of 4, you add 3 dB and you get 6 dB. So a gain of 12 dB, 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 is equivalent to an absolute factor of 16, a gain of 16. Doubling is equivalent to 3 dB or about 3 decibels. That's useful when you want to do quick analysis and comparisons of different values. Okay, that's a bit about decibels. We're going to see decibels used in our capacity equations. That's why I introduced it. But before we move on to there, let's look at some examples of signals. So back to signals. Remember we can represent a signal in the time domain or frequency domain. Some signal, we can break it into the sign components and find the frequencies of those components. Here's part of our lecture yesterday recorded. So two, less than two minutes of audio, just a WAV file. I opened up in some audio editor, Audacity. And this shows the signal as a function of time. So we can see the signal strength varying over time, over that first 1 minute 45. Of course, it's not a simple sine wave. Signals are more complex than that. We can zoom in and see some details. And we can zoom right in to see that's our signal varying over time. So the time scale now that this portion is about 5 milliseconds. So 5 milliseconds of my voice from the lecture yesterday is shown in this signal here. Okay, it's varying over time in magnitude. Again, it's not a perfect sine wave because signals are much more complex than the simple ones we've looked at in the lecture. But in theory, it can be broken down into a combination of sinusoids and we can identify the frequency components of this signal. This software has some capabilities to do that for us. It can... So it currently shows the signal in the time domain you can do some analysis and plot the spectrum, which is really the signal in the frequency domain. And I need to select all of that, analyze, plot the spectrum, and it shows me that same signal but in the frequency domain, where on this axis we have the frequencies, and here's the signal strength. And one reason to introduce dB because it's commonly expressed in decibels. But the main way to interpret this is that of that audio, the strongest signals are in these frequency ranges. So from 0 hertz or, or tens of hertz up to around 1000 hertz. When I'm talking, the audio signals in the range from, say, 1,000 up to 2,000 are not as strong as in the, the original frequency, from 0 up to 1,000. And although the audio has components ranging from 5,000 up to also 20,000 that are measured in this system, 
They are very weak. Note that this scale is using dB. So from minus 30 dB to minus 36 dB, there's a difference of 6 dB or a factor of 4. 6 dB is equivalent to a factor of 4, which means the signal here, or actually here at minus 36, is about 4 times weaker than at minus 30. So you need to be careful when this is a logarithmic scale. So these signals are in fact, or these components are very weak, their amplitude is very small. This is showing that the main frequency components of the audio recorded has greater strength in this area, around 100 to 1000 hertz. That's this area. If we look at signals, we can see the main set of frequencies that they can contain. Now we can move on and look at some aspects of capacity. Given a signal, how fast can we send data using that uh, signal or in general that communications link? What capacity in terms of sending bits do I have? Remember capacity is the, the upper limit. So when we talk about channel capacity we mean the, a communications channel or a communications link, how fast can we send bits through that communications link? That's what we care about. We saw some examples yesterday in calculating bits per second given a particular signal. This, some people have generalized this uh, and come up with some equations or some theoretical models to calculate capacity or bits per second, data rate, given the signal characteristics. The maximum data rate at which data can be transmitted across a given channel or link. And there are two theoretical models that we'll go through called Nyquist capacity and Shannon capacity, named after two different people who, who worked uh, on the, these models. And they tell us what data rate we can achieve. And in the equations, we'll see the data rate expressed as C, because it was called capacity, the highest data rate in bits per second. For a particular communications link that has some bandwidth, B, measured in hertz. And they may, in some of the models, will also consider noise and error rate. We'll see them as we come across them. So what we care is, given a communication channel, how fast can we send our bits? The first model was, was by Nyquist. Or well, Nyquist did the, main, the major amount of work on this. So Nyquist was a guy who did some analysis of communication systems and come up with a theor theoretical model, eventually an equation, that says, if we have a communications channel and there's no noise, so in the perfect world, there's no noise. In the perfect lecture, there'll be no noise. There'll be no one talking, there'll be no air conditioning sound and so on. We know in reality that there's always some background noise, and noise in the system. But if we assume that there was no noise, Nyquist did some analysis and arrived at this formula. That is, the capacity of our communication channel in bits per second is equal to two times the bandwidth of that channel times by log base 2 of M where M is the number of levels of our signal. So we know about, if, if we know the bandwidth of our channel, B, say is 1 megahertz, then we need to know something about our signal this value M, and if we can determine that, we can determine the, the Nyquist capacity, how fast we can send bits per second through that channel. So to understand this, we need to understand what is M. So we need a different example to sh show M, the number of signal levels. 
and then we'll come back to some examples of calculating Nyquist capacity. Let's draw some pictures to see what we mean by the number of levels of our signal. Recall when we went through examples yesterday, we said with a sinusoid signal, if it's high, it represents one bit and low another bit. Let's remind you of that. What we had yesterday was something... Uh, if we want to transmit the bits 0, 1, 1, 0, what we could have done was send a signal which looked like uh, 0, we could have sent a low portion, 1, high, the second one another high and the zero low portion. So that was a simple scheme that we used or we assumed where to send bits depending on whether it's zero or one we can use a different type of signal. In this case either a low signal or a high signal. So here we have just the simple portion of the sine wave. Our signal doesn't have to be a single single sine wave, it can be a combination of sinusoids. So we could express that also, say, as a digital signal. Uh, so another way to draw that, or another signal that represents that same data, is what have we got? We could draw that as a square wave, for example. Zero, we could draw low. And for one, high. So there's another signal that represents the same information. Low for bit zero, high for bit one. Zero, one, one, zero. We would say this signal has two different levels, high and low and the mapping was quite easy. We map one level to one bit. But we can do more advanced than that. We can have more than two levels in a signal and map more than one bit to each level. Let's see some examples. If we wanted to transmit a, a longer sequence of bits. If we want to First, use just two levels. We have a sequence of bits, and I've made up a set, set of bits that we want to send. Let's say just a random sequence. Zero, one, 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 zero, zero. We want to send these 10 bits. And first we're going to use a signal which is, as we've done before, low for bit 0, high for bit 1. So for bit 0, the first bit, we send a low signal. And then high for the second bit, bit one. In fact, we have three ones. So one, two, three. Let's then two zeros. Zero. And then a bit one, high again. A bit zero. And then to finish, two bit ones. One, one. 
So there's an example of a signal to represent that sequence of bits. Where the mapping was simple. We said 0 was low, 1 was high. Now let's do a different signal where we have four different levels. And the mapping of the side is here. We're going to have very low, low, high, and very high. We'll map 0, 0 to very low, 0, 1 to just low, as 1, 0 to high, and 1, 1 to very high. And I'll draw the signal of that same sequence of bits using this second scheme. In this case, we consider two bits at a time. We consider the first two bits, 0, 1, and from our scheme it says we should have a low signal. I'll draw that here for 0, 1. And then the next two bits, 1, 1, very high. What do we see? First two bits, 0, 1. From our scheme, we need a low signal. I've drawn it at this level. It's negative. The next two bits, 1, 1, very high here. And then the next two bits, 0, 0, very low, so I need to come down and continue generating the signal. Zero, zero, one, zero, and one, one. So we've got a more advanced mapping from bits to signal levels. With four different levels, we map two bits to each level. And we send the signal at a particular level for a fixed period of time. So in the first case where I map one bit to a level, this was one bit, two, three, four, and so on. In the second case, the green case, where I map two bits per level, two bits, the level is low, zero, one. The next two bits, one, one, very high. Next two bits, zero, zero, very low here. 1, 0, 1, 1. Using this scheme, under the same conditions, look at the time it takes to transmit this 10 bits. In the first scheme, if it's to the same scale, it took to here. With the green one, we finish in half the time. We have sent the same sequence of bits in half as much time, in other words, we've sent at two times the data rate. If we say that this took one second, then that would be 10 bits per second, and here we have 20 bits per second. So by increasing the number of levels, we get a higher data rate for our data transmission. That's the main point that we're arriving at. Any questions? So these schemes that I've designed here are just examples. Okay? They don't have to be the same as this, but we have a mapping from bits to signal level. And in this case, every two bits map to one of four signal levels. And we get, if we want to send those 10 bits, we get two different signals. And the main point here is that 
when we use more levels, we can send the bits faster. Because every time we transmit a signal at one level, we're sending two bits. In this case, one bit per signal uh, period. The number of levels we use in the signal is the value m in the Nyquist capacity equation. This value m. So now if we know something about our communications channel, in particular the bandwidth, b, and the signal that we're sending across it, and in particular the number of levels that it has, m, then Nyquist's capacity equation tells us that we can calculate some theoretical data rate for that channel. 2 times b times log base 2 of m, the number of levels. Let's go through some calculations and see that in, in work. Consider a telephone system. The modem that connects your computer to the telephone network allows a bandwidth of 3100 hertz. What is the maximum data rate that we can achieve in this case? The maximum theoretical data rate. First, let's make an assumption that we have a very basic sim signal with just two levels. Find the maximum data rate in this case, if the number of levels in our signal is two. Use Nyquist's capacity equation to find the, the value of C, the data rate. We're not you got too far ahead. We're not on transmission media yet. Go back. Keep going back. Yeah. We know the bandwidth of our channel, and to get started, let's assume that the number of levels for the signal that we transmit is just low and high two levels. Find the data rate for that channel. The bandwidth in this case, in the example, was 3100 hertz for our channel. And the number of levels is 2. So M is 2. So using the Nyquist equation, we can find the capacity or the data rate C is 2 times the bandwidth times log base 2 of the number of levels M. Log base 2 of 2 is simply 1, so it's 2 times 3,100, 6,200. And be careful here. The units of bandwidth is in hertz. The units of capacity is in bits per second. So the answer is 6,200 bits per second. So 
So that's a simple application of the Nyquist capacity equation. 2 times the bandwidth times log base 2 of the number of levels of the signal that we use. That was assuming we had a signal with just two levels. What if we use a different type of signal which now supports four levels? In the same channel, what do we get? What if the number of levels goes from two up to four? Everything's the same except M is now 4. Bandwidth is still the same. We can calculate the capacity again. And that's an easy one because log base 2 of 4 is simply 2. So we get twice as much. Twelve thousand four hundred bits per second. Bits per second. The, the, the bandwidth was in hertz, the data rate is in bits per second. If the bandwidth is in megahertz, then with times by 10 to the power of 6, mega 10 to the power of 6, and get megabits per second. And we see generally increasing the number of levels used in our signal will increase our data rate according to the Nyquist capacity equation. That's better. The more levels, the better. Everyone, anyone remember the old home modems, dial-up modems? Anyone else? Dial-up modem? The one that made the, the quacking sound like a duck? Quack, 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 to, 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 to when it connects? Remember? Never used one? Dial-up modem? Before your ADSL modem, yeah? Some people have used them. Do you remember how fast your dial-up modem was? A common one was 28 kilobits per second. 56 was about the maximum that we got to, 56 kilobits per second for the dial-up modem. The dial-up modem uses the telephone network. The bandwidth supported across the telephone network is what we have in this question, 3,100 hertz. That modem took your bits, created a signal with some number of levels, and transmitted them across the telephone network. How many levels did that 56 kilobit per second modem use? Let's try and determine. How many levels did your modem use? So the old dial-up modems, the maximum data rate that we can achieve was about 56 kilobits per second, maybe slightly different. Uh, so that means the data rate, the capacity we achieved was about 56,000 bits per second. And that was using the same bandwidth channel, 3,100 hertz.
how many levels did the modem use when it generated a signal? What is M? Anyone have an answer? Approximate? So the closest power of two. So if you use the Nyquist capacity equation, you know B, C, you find M. Too many, I think. Hmm? Oh, where was the decimal point? Uh, too many then. 512 sounds right. 55, five, oh, I saw the yellow one, 55800. Zero, zero. Sorry. If, if you do the calculation, if M is 512, if M is 512, log of 512 in base 2 is 9, log of 512 is 9, so our equation becomes 2 times b times 9. Log base 2 of 512 is 9, which is 9 times 6,200, which is 55.6 kilobits per second. So with these, this bandwidth, this number of levels, you get approximately 56 kilobits per second. That is, the old dial-up modems used a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz and generated a signal. They took the digital data from your computer, generated a signal with 512 different levels. Not four, but if we now have 512 levels and vary the, num the level depending upon the input bits. How do we go faster? Okay, we want to use the same equipment. We've got the same telephone network. We've only got 3,100 hertz bandwidth. How can we go faster? More levels. Just increase the levels. And in practice, it was usually a power of two. So let's go up to 1,024 levels. 2,048 levels. Keep going up to a million levels. And in theory, the data rate will go up. In practice... The more levels we have, the more chance of errors due to noise. And if you go back to the assumption about the Nyquist capacity equation, there's the assumption that there's no noise. So in theory, just increase M and you get a higher data rate. In practice, there is noise. And when there is noise, the more levels you have, the more errors you'll get which is a bad thing. So you cannot just keep increasing the number of levels or, or M. But it does show us some trade-offs. Increasing the bandwidth increases the data rate. Increasing the number of signal levels increases the data rate. That's what this equation shows us. But in practice, we cannot have an infinite number of si signal levels. There are some limits. The more signal levels, the harder it is to implement a receiver to receive that signal and make sense of it. And therefore, the more chance of errors that occur. So usually there's some practical limit of M. And in the modems, it was about 512. That limited our data rate to about 56 kilobits per second. Any questions before we look at the last equation about number of levels, how that impacts upon our signal and our data rate? Okay. 
sure. Not sure about which log. Uh, use your calculator. Okay. Yeah, okay. So two questions. Not sure about log. Okay, be sure about log. Use your calculator to calculate the logarithms and so on. Fine, you can have a calculator in the exam. But there's a lesson on the website on logarithms. It goes back to some very basics of properties of logarithms. Um, and note, sometimes we have a different base. Okay, so Nyquist capacity uses base 2. So the, the opposite operation is the exponential, 2 to the power of something. 2 to the power of 4, the log of base 2 to the power of 4 is 4. The log of the base in, in base 2 of 2 to the power of 20 is 20. So be careful of the base. If I don't give a base, assume it's 10. So check your knowledge on logarithms. The second question about, okay, what if the bandwidth was megahertz? For example, the bandwidth of 1 megahertz, let's say the number of levels was 4, our equation would give us 2b log base 2 of m, which is 2 times the bandwidth, 1. What's 1 mega? Mega is a multiplier of 10 to the power of 6. 1 times by 10 to the power of 6, times by log base 2 of 4. Log base 2 of 4 is 2, times 2 is 4, times 1 is 4, equals 4 by 10 to the power of 6 bits per second. So the, the prefix, mega, giga, kilo, or no prefix, is just a multiplier. When in a short shortcut, if we have megahertz here, then the answer we could express as 4 megabits per second, okay? or 4 by 10 to the power of 6 bits per second. Last, or the second and last equation. Nyquist assumed that there's no noise and come up with this model. If we know something about the channel, if we assume there's no noise, then we can determine its capacity. In reality, in every communications channel, there is noise. Shannon, another guy, came up with a different model that took into account noise. When we have noise, we start to get errors. And to avoid errors, we, if we have a higher data rate, we get more errors. So to avoid that, then in the presence of noise, our data rate or capacity is generally lower than if there's no noise. So Shannon came up with this different model relating bandwidth B to capacity or data rate C. And he takes into account the noise and the signal strength or the signal power. So we transmit a signal, if we receive it with some power level, and there's also noise in the system, which has a power level denoted as n, or the noise power, then we can say the ratio between the received signal and the noise is the signal-to-noise ratio, SNR. If we know that for a communication channel, then using Shannon capacity equation, we can determine the data rate in that channel. So we now have three things. Receive signal strength, or signal power in this equation. The receive noise, so transmissions from others. If we know that, then we can determine the signal to noise ratio, SNR. And if we know the bandwidth of the channel, then we can calculate the capacity 
with, with this equation. The signal to noise ratio is a is a factor here, an absolute factor. Sometimes it's expressed in dB, decibels, because again it's just a ratio of two power levels. Here's an example. We have a channel that uses a spectrum between 3 and 4 megahertz. The channel we've measured the signal to noise ratio, that is the ratio between the received signal strength and the received noise is measured to be 24 dB. Before answering the second part, first answer the question, given that channel and the signal to noise ratio, what's the capacity? What is the capacity according to Shannon's equation? If we know the spectrum and the signal to noise ratio. First, what's the bandwidth? Spectrum ranges from 3 to 4 megahertz. The bandwidth is 1 megahertz. Let's record what we know. So with the spectrum 3 to 4, we get a bandwidth of 1 megahertz. And we said the signal to noise ratio was 24 dB. Now be careful. Shannon's equation, SNR is not measured in dB. This value, we cannot put the dB value in here. We need to convert it back to the absolute value using our general decibel equation. So let's try and do that. So 24 dB equals 10 times log base 10 10 of the absolute value of SNR. Note I distinguish between the absolute value of SNR and the SNR measured in dB, so the subscript dB here. To use Shannon capacity formula, we need this value. We know in dB we need this value. So you need to solve this equation for SNR. So bring 10 across to the other side, divide by 10, we get 2.4 equals log base 10 of SNR. So what's SNR? 10 to the power of 2.4. Divide by 10, we get 2.4 equals log base 10 of SNR. So SNR is 10 to the power of 2.4. And you need your calculator for that one. Anyone tell me the answer? Two hundred and two hundred and fifty one about. So, we just have to be careful here. The signal to noise, noise ratio of 251 means the received signal is 251 times greater than the noise. Signal to noise ratio. So, signal 251 times greater than noise. But of course, we can also express that in, in dB. 10 times log base 10 of 251 is 24 decibels. So two different, uh, two different expressions of the same value in this case. The Shannon capacity equation uses the value 251. 
So we now get capacity is bandwidth log phase 2 of 1 plus SNR. And our bandwidth is 1 megahertz, 1 by 10 to the power of 6, times log of base 2 of 1 plus 251, which is 252. SNR was 251. You'll use your calculator and you'll get approximately 8 mega, megabits per second. Log base 2 of 252 is about 8, a little bit less than 8, times by 1 million gives us 8 million, 8 million bits per second or 8 megabits per second. So in this case, we know the channel bandwidth, B was 1 megahertz. We know the signal to noise ratio in decibels. We needed to convert that to the absolute value and we got the value 251 for SNR. 251 plus 1, 252 log in base 2 is about 8 times by a million. Capacity or data rate of this channel is 8 megabits per second. So we have two different models of how to determine the capacity of a communications channel. They, they make different assumptions. One is assume no noise, one assumes noise. Uh, if you assume no noise, you just need to know the bandwidth and number of levels, M. But if there is actually noise, then you need to be able to measure that, or more precisely measure the signal to noise ratio. And we don't have a way to measure it in this case, in this class, we, or a way to calculate it. We, uh, um, it would be measured in practice. So it would be given, for example, in a question. But carefully, SNR, the absolute value is used in the Shannon capacity equation, not the dB value. So we determine the capacity of the channel. What was our question? A channel uses a spectrum of 3 to 4 megahertz, giving us a bandwidth of 1 megahertz. SNR, in, SNR is 24 decibels. We converted that to an absolute value of 251. And we determined the capacity in that case is 8 megabits per second. The question is how many signal levels are required to achieve 8 megabits per second? Anyone know the answer? How many signal levels are needed to achieve 8 megabits per second? <laughs> 16 is the correct answer. Our capacity is 8 megabits per second. Our bandwidth, B, we know to be 1 megahertz. Now if we apply Nyquist equation, remember Nyquist says C equals 2B log base 2 of M. The question is how many signal levels? What's the value of M? So C is 8 megabits per second, 8 by 10 to the power of 6, times 2 times the bandwidth of 1 by 10 to the power of 6, times log base 2 of M, it's an M, therefore you can find M. Sixteen. 
because 8 divided by 2 is 4, log base 2 of 16 equals 4. So in that case, we, we combined or used both of those uh, capacity equations to determine the answer. So let's summarize about the two capacity equations. Nyquist come up with a one equation assuming no noise, so a perfect environment. From that we can determine the capacity or data rate. Shannon had a different model that took into account noise if we know the noise, in particular the signal to noise ratio, and it's another way to determine the capacity. Uh, they are both theoretical models. In real life, we can never achieve the capacity because there are other impairments. But they give us an upper limit. So we can approximate what we can achieve. We may not get to the 8 megabits per second, but we should be able to get close under, under good conditions. So it gives us an upper limit as to what we can achieve with a particular channel. And some of the trade-offs we see, increasing Increasing bandwidth increases our data rate. B goes up, C goes up. Increasing the signal power also increases the data rate. Transmit with a higher power, receive with a higher power, the SNR goes up if everything else is fixed. If SNR goes up, the capacity or data rate goes up. Increasing the noise, the noise power, SNR goes down and the capacity goes down. In more noise, lower data rate. Now something the equations don't show but happens in practice, generally the more bandwidth, the larger the bandwidth, the more noise is possible. So another trade-off. And if you transmit at a high power, use high signal power, we said high data rate, but it can cause more interference, again has in, having negative effects on other transmissions. So again in practice it's not as simple as this equation, but at least gives us an approximation of what we can achieve in some channel. There are other practical factors that impact upon the data rate. And we've finished this topic on data transmission. Next week we'll look a quickly about different types of media, different types of cable technologies and wireless technologies, and then return and look at this in more depth. Some specific schemes to map bits to signals, data to signals, and we'll look at a variety of real schemes, not just some made up ones I've given here. Any questions on capacity? Very useful. Go and read about Shannon, Claude Shannon, the guy who created this equation. He did many things other than this equation regarding communications, regarding digital circuits, and regarding cryptography. So many things this guy came up with uh, which are very important in communications, in security, and in digital systems.